Hi, welcome to another First Chapter Friday. I am so pleased to announce that this is one of my favorite books so far in 2024, and it is The Kill Factor by Ben Oliver. The reason I like it is because it feels like a combination of all of us villains, um, hashtag murder trending, and The Hunger Games, all wrapped up in one, okay? Like little elements of each. And I found all of those super entertaining. All right, so let us begin. Hope you like this one too. Chapter one. Emerson Ness had not been scared in a very long time. And now she was terrified. The room was gray, not only in color, but in character too. Perfectly square, perfectly dull. No windows. The only light came from two fluorescent headache bulbs that flickered overhead. The table was off-center in a very purposeful way. Emerson sat at that table, trying not to think. They want you to think, she told herself. They want you to replay the events over and over until you're not sure what happened and what didn't happen. That's why everything is so gray and dull, so that you've got nothing to focus on other than your thoughts. She tried then to clear her mind, but it was impossible. She was shaking. She saw it in her hands as she nervously pulled at her fingertips and then noticed a thrumming throughout her entire body. Stop that, she commanded herself, but no amount of trying would slow down the tremor that ran through her like a current. And as she stared at her earthquake hands, her mind drifted back to the reason she was in this room. She saw the flames eating up the building. She heard the sirens wailing into the night, smelling that burnt hair smell. No, she told herself, think of something else. You're scared, that's all. Arson was a serious crime, especially when it was a school that burned down. The government didn't take kindly to people who destroyed their property. Cost the government money, and you were looking at jail time. She knew it didn't look good. She had been caught on the school grounds late at night, clutching a bag full of money, and the building burning at her back. When was the last time you were this scared? She scoured her mind, moving back through her 16 years of life, trying to remember when she had last been truly terrified. It had been nine years ago, when she was seven, and her brother Kester had been an infant. Their mother had been dead only a few months, and their father had gone off to make content, spending the night in the catacombs with nothing but a cheap camera drone and a thin blanket. Everything that man did was for views and followers. Maybe he was right. Maybe it really was the only currency that mattered anymore. While he had been away, Kester had gotten sick. Really sick. At first his breathing had been a little ragged, a little wheezy. But then it started to rattle. Sounds like he's got rocks in his breath, she had thought as she stood at her little brother's door, holding her own breath and trying not to cry. He had started coughing then, coughing and coughing, and after a while it sounded like he was drowning. Emerson had tried to call their dad, but there was no signal in the catacombs. She had gotten angry, smashing the ancient cell phone on the kitchen floor and then punching the door so hard her knuckles bled. Then she had started to panic, running out the baby's room, pressing her hands against her ears, and then running back in, willing him to miraculously get better. Stop now! Stop, Kester! Stop that! But he didn't get better. He only got worse. She had leaned over his cot and yelled at her tiny brother, Please stop! Please! Finally, she had gotten a hold of herself and called an ambulance. The paramedics had agreed to meet her, but they refused to drive down to the burrows. So she had to wrap up her distressed brother and run to the entrance of the tunnel. Kester had an infection in his lungs that had turned into pneumonia. The doctor saved his life. 
Thirty hours later, when she had returned home carrying her baby brother in her arms, their father had been sitting in his computer editing the footage of his night in the catacombs, oblivious. She had hated him in that moment, and she had never forgiven him. That same kind of fear was in her again now, here in this interrogation room where at any second now an officer, maybe two, would enter and tell her that she was looking at prison. A building had burned to the ground, and $900 of physical cash had been stolen. Physical money was not as valuable as brand credits, but theft was theft. She imagined slowing time right down until seconds lasted minutes and hours lasted days. Then she imagined time running backward, the door to the interrogation room opening, the police uncuffing her and marching her backward into the wagon, the mugshot drone erasing photographs of her. And then she thought, if I could go back in time, why not just keep going? And so in her mind, days rushed by, fading from dark to light, the moon reversing across the sky, chasing closely by the sun, years and years, faster and faster, before Kester was born, until finally time began to move forward again at a regular speed. And Emerson was six years old, and her mother was still alive. Em, her mother had said, holding out an ethereal hand. Emerson reached out for that hand and had almost touched it when she was snatched from her reverie by the interrogation room door opening. Two officers came in and sat down in the bigger, more comfortable chairs opposite of her. There were no introductions, no greetings, not even a moment of eye contact. The short female officer spoke first. It is currently 2.41 in the morning on December 12th. Special Agent Dern interviewing suspect alongside Officer Bannon. Let me get some information clear for the report. Your first name, Emerson, is spelled E-M-E-R-S-O-N. Yeah, that's right, Emerson said, and cleared her throat after hearing the vibration in her voice. She reminded herself to be tough. You've done nothing wrong. Remember that. Yes, you stole the money, but it was only to feed your family. It's not your fault the building burned. And last name, Ness, spelt N-E-S-S. Yes, Emerson replied. And address is 2331-19 The Barrows. This list of meaningless questions sparked anger in Emerson. This is dumb. I shouldn't be here. I, in a minute, the officer said, holding up a hand, still not making eye contact. Emerson clenched her jaw, irritated that she had been shut down so effectively. I know you have already been read your rights, Ms. Ness, but I'm going to repeat them now so that they are on record. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. You have the right to an attorney, which you can pay for in brand credits or cash, and if you cannot afford one, one will be provided for you. Do you understand what I have told you? Emerson had been in situations like this before many times and had learned that she could push aside almost all other emotions if she filled herself up with anger. She did this now. Yeah, I'm not stupid. Do you want a lawyer? Don't need one. I haven't done anything. For the record, the suspect has chosen of her own free will to waive her right to lawyer. The officer finally made eye contact, and all Emerson could see in those eyes was ambition. You were arrested outside Stone's Throw High School shortly after midnight this morning. Is that correct? Does this one speak? Emerson asked, pointing at the tall, square-faced officer sitting next to Agent Dern. Answer the question, please. I was arrested, but I still don't know why. You were apprehended outside a burning school with a bag full of stolen money. 
Why do you think you were arrested? Sarcasm? Emerson replied. Really? Is this how the police conduct their business now these days? You're impulsive, aren't you, Miss Ness? You don't think before you speak, and you don't think before you act. So, for those reasons, I'll spell out to you exactly what you're being charged with. You are under arrest on suspicion of theft and arson. She paused. And manslaughter. Emerson slowly sat up in her uncomfortable gray chair, and she stared at Agent Dern. What'd you say? Manslaughter, Miss Ness. It means, in this case, that you committed unintentional homicide in a criminally negligent manner. Her anger dissolved away like ink in water. Some, someone died? Agent Dern looked at her watch. About 12 minutes ago, a man named Marvin Zhu, a janitor, he died from injuries sustained at the scene, burns, smoke, inhalation. Agent Dern took a photograph of a man in his 60s out of a manila envelope and placed it on the table between them. Emerson stared at the man. His eyes, sad and soulful, seemed to gaze right back at her. She recognized those eyes. She felt her heart twisting in her chest like a bag full of rodents. Suddenly it was hard to breathe. Her vision blurred and then came into focus almost too sharp. I, I changed my mind. I do want a lawyer. That's entirely your choice, Ms. Ness, Agent Dern said, closing the case file, that had sat in front of her, and standing up, Officer Bannon stood up almost at the same time. Interview paused at 0245 hours. They exited the room without so much as a glance back, leaving the photograph of Marvin Sue on the table. The silence that followed seemed to fall down from the ceilings like dust, and in that silence, Emerson felt like she couldn't catch her breath. Her feet felt numb. Her thoughts were tumbling in her mind. She was sure that she could feel the earth spiraling through space. She gripped the underside of her chair. She had to hold on to something, to, or, or she'd be cast into the infinite void. Dead, she thought. Someone died? Someone died? They're dead. The confidence and determination of Agent Dern had scared her at first, and now it terrified her. Emerson took one last look at the photograph on the table and then turned it over. She had a criminal record already. That meant it would be all too easy to pin this on her. And when they did, she would spend the next two decades in a room even more dull and gray than this one. I can't let that happen, Emerson told herself. I can't. Kester needs me. I, I can't leave him alone. Get a grip, Em. You need to think. Get a hold of yourself. But she couldn't seem to access her thoughts. All she could see in her mind's eye was the flashing of the mugshot drones that had circled her at the scene of the crime, taking photos as the school burned behind her, the flames reaching their skinny fingers up into the black sky. The door to the interrogation room opened again after what felt to Emerson like hours, though perhaps it had only been minutes. A short man with white hair and small round glasses entered. Are you my lawyer? Emerson asked, no longer able to hide the fear in her voice. The man ignored her question. Instead, he ambled over to the table and sat down on the chair that Agent Dern had vacated and he took out a virtual notepad from his pocket. He placed it on the table, glanced at Emerson over the tops of his glasses, and then used his fingerprint to open the virtual stack of documents that hovered in the air between them. What's this? Emerson asked. Emerson Ness, the old man said, and smiled warmly. You might be the luckiest girl alive right now. Emerson's brow furrowed as she looked at the newcomer. Look around, old man. 
Do I look lucky to you? The old man laughed, a hearty and friendly sound. No, no, you certainly do not. But rest assured, you are. Are you going to explain? Emerson asked and felt the tiniest flicker of hope inside her. She extinguished it quickly, though. Experience had taught her to never get her hopes up. Explain I shall, the man said, smiling that charming, kindly smile. And Emerson felt herself warming up to the man in spite of herself. You're lucky, Miss Ness, because I came along just at the right time. You see, I'm your ticket out of all this mess. My ticket? I'm sorry, what's going on? He laughed again and then leaned back in his chair. Forgive me, Miss Ness. I'm being cryptic. I don't mean to be. Let me try to be more clear. I'm a producer, which means I'm in charge of bringing together a team of people to create a television show. Now correct me if I'm wrong, Miss Ness, but you're looking down the barrel of at least 15 years in maximum security. Slate County. They're going to try you as an adult, understand? Even though you're 16, they're going to try you as an adult because you've got a criminal history, including aggravated assault and forgery. I can explain all that, Emerson tried. She'd done it for her brother. She wanted to say she hadn't had a choice. You're going to explain it to a jury? He raised a white eyebrow. I, I, it doesn't matter, the man said, waving a hand. You're not setting a foot in a courtroom. And if you win the competition, you're not setting foot in prison either. You won't have to worry about any of that once you sign this contract. Competition? Emerson asked. Listen, the producer said leaning in close and gesturing to the dim room. All of this crap, this is how they keep people like you down. You're a young, intelligent girl with all the potential in the world, and yet you're fighting for your life every day. How is that fair? Can I tell you a secret? I hate this system. I'm from the same place as you, Ms. Ness. I'm from the boroughs, and I had to use every ounce of strength to get out. I want to offer you a chance to get out, too. Emerson looked at the digital contract that hung between them. What is it? she asked. What does it say? The producer laughed, and he raised both hands out to his sides in a gesture of evangelical praise. It says you're going to walk out of this station and wave to those arrogant cops on the way. That's what it says. Did you see that, Agent Dern? She wants you. She wants to see you burn. She knows you've got no defense, Ms. Ness. No brand value to pay for a lawyer. I could see it in her eyes. Be honest. What are your credits worth? How many followers do you have? Under a thousand, I'd wager. Somehow Emerson knew the producer had looked into her already. He knew she had no followers at all, meaning her digital brand credits were worth less than physical cash. What would I have to do? Emerson asked. That's the best part, the producer said, lacing his fingers behind his head, as if they were both relaxing on a summer's day. All you have to do is be yourself, be likable, watch your follower count grow by the millions, and your currency becomes valuable beyond your wildest dreams. Emerson sat back in her chair and she looked at the producer's smiling eyes to the floating stack of papers between them. You're going to have to give me more than that, Emerson said. I don't understand what's going on here. The producer sighed and sat forward. Emerson, we don't have the time to go into details. I wish we did, but the chief of this place has given me exactly five minutes. 
suffice to say, it's that this is a one in a billion opportunity. You happen to be a prime candidate for a new show with a very real prize. That prize is freedom. If you don't sign on the dotted line in the time I've allotted myself to meet with you, that opportunity will go to someone else. Listen to me, girl. You were born to fail. It's not your fault. It's just the facts as I see them. I'm offering you an opportunity to change the narrative of your life. Emerson swallowed. What is the show about? You're still asking questions? Really? I'm offering you a cure for cancer and you're asking me what flavor the pill is. Emerson looked into the fatherly eyes of this strange man who had burst into her life at her most vulnerable. There has to be a catch, she replied. Nobody gets to walk away for free. The producer nodded slowly. You're smart, Emerson Ness. Too smart to be in a place like this. The show goes like this. Fifty young people on the verge of imprisonment will take part in various games. The difficulty of these games is determined by how many followers you earn through the show. If you lose a game, you'll face a public vote against who has the least amount of followers. The person voted off is incarcerated in a maximum security prison with no contact from the outside world and no contact from other prisoners. The sentence is automatically life in solitary. The one person with the most followers at the end is free to go. And not just free to go, but free to go with hundreds of thousands of new followers, advertising endorsements, and popularity that will set them up for life. Emerson's head was spinning. This had come out of nowhere. One minute she had been mentally preparing herself for a decade or more in the Slate County. And now this man, with his compassionate face and caring words, came along offering her... What? The clock is ticking, Miss Ness, the producer said, his voice quiet and understanding. Emerson tried to process everything he had said. It wasn't freedom he was offering, but a one in fifty chance of freedom. The price she had to pay was going to be paraded on screens across the world as entertainment. She was aware of the seconds ticking away as she considered the producer's offer. Finally, she came to a decision. No, she said. No, he repeated, the smile on the producer's face melting away like spring ice. That's right. I said no. Uh, I? Uh, he laughed. I, I wasn't expecting that. Can I ask why? Your show, whatever it's called, is disgusting. It's exploiting people. You're using people's darkest moments as entertainment. You're using people's desperation to amuse others, and I, I can't be part of that. She lifted her chin. Besides, if I don't win, which is likely, I'll be exchanging 15 years in prison for life in prison. That's no prize. The producer kept his expression of amusement. We're offering people an opportunity. Then offer it, Emerson interrupted. Don't dangle it in front of people's faces and make them dance for it. He laughed, sat back in his seat and ran his hands through his hair and laughed again. He swiped his hands over the documents and they disappeared. Well, I'm not going to beg you, Emerson. I... Respect your decision, but this is an opportunity that thousands of kids in your situation would bite my hand off for. If you don't want it, someone else will. He stood up and he pocketed the virtual notebook. Your father will be disappointed, though. Emerson sat up. What do you mean? Huh? The producer said and turned back around to face Emerson. Oh, just that we need consent from a parent or a guardian in order to validate your involvement in the show. 
Your father gave us that signature less than an hour ago. He seemed very happy to give his permission. You're lying, Emerson said. Her dad was a mediocre parent at best, but sure, surely she couldn't believe he'd go so far as to practically consign his only daughter to life in prison. The producer put the virtual notebook back on the table and scanned it. The documents reappeared between them, and the producer pulled out a final sheet. Her father's name, Marcus Ness, was scrawled across the bottom. He cares about you, the producer said. He wants to give you a chance to walk free. That's a good dad in my book. Emerson traced each letter of her father's name with her eyes, feeling her stomach sink. He doesn't care, she said. All he wants is... But there was no time to finish her sentence. The door to the interrogation room flew open and the two officers entered. All right, Agent Duren said. That's time. All he wants is a famous daughter so he can grow his own brand. Emerson finished her thought. She pictured Kester in her mind. Kester, who was more intelligent than both of them. Kester, who was born deaf in a society that had given him next to no support. Emerson looked into the eyes of the producer. How could someone be so benevolent, make such a cruel offer? I can't do it, Emerson told him. She felt a moment of dizziness as though her entire future had just taken a step off a high and sheer cliff. I'll I'll tell you what, the producer said. I'll post your bail. You'll be out of here tomorrow, and I'll give you one more day after that to decide. We can even add a clause stipulating that all of your social media and credit accounts will transfer to your brother in the event that you are incarcerated. Emerson opened her mouth to tell him she didn't need any more time, that her mind was made up, but the words wouldn't come. The producer put a big papery hand on her shoulder offered her one last smile, and then left her to be escorted to a holding cell by Agent Dern and the silent Officer Bannon. End of chapter one. Okay. So, opens up with that very vulnerable, very very sad start to her um, story. And then she is going to be on a cruise ship. I'm not going to get into many details, but obviously she does accept the offer or there would be no book. And on this cruise ship, the 50 kids, they're all around the same age. Um, They're pretty much in competition with each other. And yet they're trying to make bonds and it becomes kind of a um, a survival of the fittest and other things. And it's, there's always a layer and always a catch that is surprising. And uh, the people that you expect sometimes to be the most evil may not be. It was just very enjoyable. I needed to know what happened after every chapter, it just kept pulling me along. I feel like that's what it will do to everyone. It's a very enjoyable book. The way it ends, I could just do a whole show on how that made me feel. Um, So after you've read the book, please come back and make comments about what you thought about that ending without exactly stating it. You know what I mean? No spoilers. Okay. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you're having a very nice week. Take care.